Live. We're live. Hi. Uh, welcome to Pink Table Talk once again, which which I love. This is a uh, my favorite thing: conversation with smart, awesome people in the industry, the ones that groom, the ones that make scissors for us, which is the theme today and sharpen, sharpen, oh my God, how important it is for us guys, groomers. So today we have one of the best in the industry, Nick Sklar, correct? Yes, ma'am. And uh, he is from Whitman's and has been sharpening for how many years, Nick? And making scissors and that being your passion. How long has it been? Boy, that's gonna <laughs> make me mad. Uh, <laughs> I was nine or ten years old when I started, so oh. years. Wow. Okay, long time. So definitely, definitely, all the questions that you have, I think Nick could answer today. I'm going to be speaking from a groomer point of view and asking question, <clears throat> asking Nick questions about our tools because even though I've been grooming for 33 years. And I am a scissor tool junkie, like I am a hoarder. But of course, I don't know a lot about the detail on how, what material I use, what is the best material, what is the best length for different people. Is that true, Nick, that different people are comfortable with different lengths and shanks of scissors, let's say? That's that's a hundred percent true. You know, right. if you come to like our booth at a show, you will see a hundred pairs of scissors sitting there. Everyone's hand is different. Everyone starts off and they start a different capacity. You know, like I'm sure you'll pick up a nine, ten inch scissor and groom whatever you want because you've been holding a scissor forever. A lot that scares people when they just start out. A lot of people start out with like a seven inch scissor, a shorter shank, and then they will build their way up from there. I tell you what, I mean, I could probably groom a dog with a 10, 11 inch scissors, but I don't think I'm going to be comfortable. I don't have those anymore in my arsenal. I did. I used to have a lot of 10. And, remember those 11 inches? I don't yeah. see them anymore. Is, is, is it like a dying tool? What do you think? It's, it really boils down to control, in my opinion. It, right. A lot of them were heavy. Yeah. Um, they they also for sharpening purposes they didn't fit on a lot of machines and they just it was a it was a good concept when it came out because everyone said I want bigger I want bigger I want bigger so you know the nice thing about me growing up in this industry I watched the scissors change over time I watched when like the Japanese started coming in changing to the convex edge but they I remember when they went to that bigger style the next style the next big one if it was the Filipino style when it hit that point everyone bought them. And then they kind of said it's a little too big. And they mm -hmm. started reverting back more and a little bit scaled down. Your most common size now for a big one is a, is a nine, it's a nine and a half inch scissor. So it turns out size does matter. It does. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, my hand, if you can see it, it's like a, a, a 10 year old child's hand. It's really, really tiny. My thumb is maybe an inch long. So for me, and I'm sure there's women with small hands out there listening to us, and of course, there's a lot of groomers like that. For me, I always felt more comfortable with short, the shortest shank I can get ever. That's me. But if you put, you add an 11 inch blade to that, I always felt, I had a couple of pairs and I always felt out of balance. Now, is it, is, it, is it correct that a short shank and a really long blade is kind of out of balance? <clears throat> Boy, there's, I could talk on that all day. There's a lot of- I can't hear you. I can't hear- Can you hear me now? Yeah, you can keep talking. Okay, so the short shank design on- I can't hear Nick at all. Oh, no. Okay. Is it on my end? Now I can hear you. The short shank design was designed, and I got a couple 
scissors here, but like something like this here. This is just a Shinobi scissor. It has a short mm -hmm. shank on it. It was designed with the balance actually for beauticians with a scissor this size. Brought over from the beautician world into the grooming app. So the balance of how they were made was a six, seven inch scissor. But when you get a scissor that's this long, when you actually take the action and you open and close it, this, the variance here from over to here is pivot point is. When you add the extra length here, it get it's hard to under and it'll start to teach. Oh yes. And that's what, and that's why technically, uh, uh, guys, I have such an echo in my ears, I can't even speak. Techno, got a Techno, well, I don't know anything about it. I know I'm uncomfortable like that. Oh, there's questions. Yes? Am I seeing correctly? What's happening? I can hear. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nick, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay, Hello. now now it's perfect. Thank you, guys. Beautiful. You actually, you actually sound better now. Right, you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, what I was saying is that that's probably why technically I didn't ever feel comfortable with a longer blade and short shank. Because I never know what the technical reason is. Like, if you ask me a grooming question, I could sit here for two hours explaining to you why. You do this, so you do that. With scissors, I don't know. I know some of them are really comfortable and make me uh, a better groomer because we are as good as our tools at some point. And some of them are uncomfortable. Do we have any questions, guys? Not yet. Not yet. So we keep talking. So now I have, I have a new line of shears of my own. It's not that I wanted to make a business out of that, which is a business anyway, but, but um, I wanted to have a line um, that I can use myself every day, that's one, and two, groomers can enjoy very much. I don't have a lot of choices, I only have a few, uh, a, a blender, a chunker, a straight and the curve, for right now, I really myself don't like having huge amount of choices. What would you suggest if somebody like me or anybody else wants to have their own line of shears? Uh, what kind of choices is the best to have in a line? Like a million like some companies or just a few? What is your opinion on that? Well, a million is to go ahead and cover everybody, but a few is, is the way to go. Having a blender and a chunker, you're, you're right on there. The most common scissor to start with would be an, would be an eight inch straight. Um, that's your most popular selling one. Um, from there, obviously your, your curves. Most people tend to go ahead and either make a decision, they'll jump up to get the nine next or the seven, but they'll, they'll find a line that they want and they'll stick with it, you know, seven, eight, nine, a good thinner and a good chunker. From there, they'll get feedback and then they'll start tailoring their next line to what they want, handles different directions. You mentioned earlier, you know, you have a shorter thumb. When we have people walk up, I look at people's hands, and I call them P 
piano fingers. If you have <laughs> longer fingers and longer, you would naturally gravitate towards the longer shanks on different styles of scissors. Um, <clears throat> like Kenshi has a five star line. They have a short shank and then they have a long shank. It's just for that purpose. Actually, past the handles, everything is the same on the scissor. It's to accommodate all those different individuals. So with you starting out your own line in that aspect, I would highly recommend where you're going. Um, do you know if you were making them more like a beveled style or a convex edge style? Convex. Excellent. It's a convex so with that's... with a thicker blade, if you know what I mean. Thicker blade. Mm -hmm. I do. Because, I yeah, because what I wanted out of them is... Um, I don't know if you, when I was competing, I don't know if you saw me in the ring sometime or if you knew who I was when I was competing, but I was that crazy suicidal competitor that would bring six months of hair in the ring. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't like to use clippers. I didn't. So I always used to have a big assassinator shear that I could whack some hair off. And then I had to have a finishing shear, which yes. an assassinator would not give me that finish that I wanted. So I wanted to create a pair of shears that would do both at the same time. Okay. So I could whack some big amounts of hair off and then use the same shear to put a finish on. So far my straights are doing that and I'm loving it. But yeah, that's that's what I'm doing, and the longest right now is seven and a half. So what you're gonna have there? Well, it's it's funny you you mentioned if I recognized you when you were out competing and stuff. Um, I actually thought to myself, when did I actually you know like put down on paper like you were there and who you were? When we go to the shows, you see everyone. It's so busy. Like I always saw you around different places, and I remember when I realized how talented of an individual you were. We were at. PCA, and for those watching, that's Poodle Club of America. It's an international poodle show. People go from all over the place. And I, I was, I walked by, and I saw you standing there. And I'd always seen you in, in the grooming world. And the grooming world didn't really intermix with the AKC world that often, compared to starting to mingle more now. And I asked you, I said, "What are you doing here?" And you looked right at me. And you said, "I'm here to fix poodles. They are groomed wrong." <laughs> and I said, "Oh, okay." So, like an hour later, I saw you again grooming a poodle, and I saw exactly what you were doing, and that's, that's what I was like, this lady knows how to groom poodles. Yeah, I actually came into the competitive world from Confirmation. Confirmation was my first world, okay. and competition started by accident, pretty much. So, my, my world is show dogs and uh, dressage when I was younger, horses. Sure. But then kind of happened and I jumped in the competition ring and the rest is history. It kind of sucked me in. Mine's but, the same exact way as, as horses when I was a kid and it was the AKC confirmation ring showing and then slowly just started converting over towards the more the competition side. Mm -hmm. So um, your name it sounds really Russian. Are you? Herman. Huh? German. Oh, German. Sklar German. is actually a Russian name, the last name. There's really? so many Sklars in Russia and Ukraine. Oh, yeah. You and I are going to have to talk more about that because I'm <laughs> actually one of the last ones. There's four of us left that I know of. Yeah. It, you probably go back to where I'm from with that last name. It was just interesting. I thought, you know, you guys are Russian, maybe second, third generation. That's probably why we get along. Oh, probably, right? And we both smoke. <laughs> Still smoke maybe cigarettes. It's sort of bad for you, but yes. <laughs> That's a European thing. <laughs> okay. We have a yes, we have a question. What should a new baby look like? What should a newbie be looking for in their like first set of scissors, I'm guessing? That's going to boil down to two things. There's two styles of scissors on the market right now. 
you have what they call a beveled edge scissor and you have a convex edge scissor which is what you with your line mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah a, a convex edge scissor is great for finish work how it leaves the hair it is pristine all your competition dogs akc dogs are finished in a, in a convex style edge it cuts the hair clean through with the cuticle a beveled edge scissor doesn't do quite as good as job the big difference is a beveled edge scissor is less expensive to maintain. It's ten dollars to get sharpened. Um, a convex scissor, depending on where you go, can be twenty-five to thirty-five dollars to get it done. Uh, um, edge scissor can hold to way more uh -huh. of, the, of the finish cutting. Uh, it depends on if you look for finish work, convex style wedge. Anywhere you go. Just ask anyone, just I want a beveled or a convex, and they can show you a, a plethora of all different kinds. So for you broke up just a little bit for a couple of seconds, but uh, for a newbie, you would you would suggest a beveled edge, right? If, if you're just starting out, yeah. Yeah. So a beveled edge, what would be the length, do you think? I mean, but it depends on the hand and fingers like we were talking about. Piano fingers, long shank. My little nubs, short chain. <laughs> I would say a seven or an eight is a standard size. So yeah, I mean, that's what I always thought. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's, that's what I always that's, thought. That's the exactly. first, the first pair should be maybe eight inches, and then you go either smaller or larger. But that would be your ultimate size of a shear when you get the first pair. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. From there, you get smaller ones for your feet work. Once you, I always tell people, once you start grooming, you're going to figure out what the scissor does on a dog. It doesn't fit in this area. It's too big for this area. And you'll learn your own style. People like to flip their scissors around. So once you get that one set and start going, you can, you'll, you'll know if you want something shorter or longer. Right, right. But to start with eight is perfect. Yes. Yeah. Okay, more? Yes. Okay. What would be a double-sided thinning shear for a movie? That's what would be a what? Double-sided thinning shear. So oh, it's up there. I can't see the whole thing because of the camera. It's right in the middle. What would be a double-sided thinning shear for a, newbie. for a newbie? Oh, let me, before we answer that question, bear with us, whoever asked that question. <coughs> So here's what I know technical names for shears are. Sure. Uh, solid blade and the blade with the teeth would be blenders. Both sides with the teeth would be thinners. And blades on each tooth with the solid blade would be chunkers. Am I correct or am I not correct? Very close. Okay. Tell me. Tell me. So we can clear the air on that. Okay, so there's a big misconception between with thinners, between a thinner and a blender. Yes, you, there is. And manufacturers are not good at this. I have two different scissors here, and it's gonna be very hard to go ahead and explain this via the camera. So I'm just gonna try and lightly explain it. The one in this hand right here, if you look at the teeth on this part, the very top, it has a V that sits in it. Okay. If it has a hair comes on either side, it hits and it thins it. It does thinning work. On this style, on, on, the, on the teeth, it actually has stair-step pattern. The stair-step pattern is a, it will blend the hair. The hair goes into multiple different notches on this one. So if you see a V in there, it's more thinner. If you see the stair step design, it's the blender. And you are correct that you have with the solid teeth like this that are that are big, this is what they call a chunker. Um, and I can go ahead and expound into the, that person's question actually from that. Yes. This tool right here, a chunker, replaced uh, double-sided thinning scissors. When I was younger, I used to sell 30, 40 different kinds of them. We sell three. Yeah. 
to do is when I used to go ahead and room, I would go ahead and use them on like a chest or like a new. Nowadays, you take this tool and you go and, and you whack what code you want. And if you make a mistake, you come back through with and you, and you fine tune what you want to have done. There really is no newbie double sided thinner anymore. It's more specialized. All of them are going to be for the more experienced groomers. Any, you can buy scissors from $50 to $5,000. Most of your double-sided thinners are going to start around $200 because it's more specialized. Someone knows how to use them. If you're just learning and you're a newbie, get a pair of chunkers. You'll have far more success with a pair of those. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. So uh, somebody else asked um, to explain what is the difference between blenders and thinners, but I think we already covered it just now. There was another question. So. Yeah. So um, a chunker, somebody said they're called fishtails. That's kind of new to yes. me. So if somebody's talking, I just bought fishtails, or I, I want to buy fishtails, they're talking about chunkers. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. That's correct. And wh why fishtails? Is that because of the shape of the tooth? So it's, you have, you have the tooth that's like straight right here. And at the mm -hmm. very back of it has a little point that sticks up. Right. Um, they, they actually come from the beautician side. They're actually a, a softer chunker that how it leaves a, a certain pattern. They're not very popular in our industry because they, they will bind easy and they, they will cut the fur in a very light manner. Um, we actually modify a lot of them for people. We take them off because um, they don't know what they get when they're buying. If you know what a fishtail is designed for, it does a great job. They're not designed to get in and whack out coat. It's designed to be a very soft cutting scissor. That extra tooth slows it down, and it actually doesn't cut very well in that area. It makes it softer. So if you want something more aggressive, stay away from the fishtails. Okay, so in, if we talk about hair industry, human hair industry, those are texturizers, correct? Exactly what they are. Right, so that's why it's a softer kind of finish and it just texturizes without cutting any length, much length off. Am I understanding that correctly? Okay, awesome. See, it. I know, I know a little bit, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nick said, I think he was breaking up a little bit, but Nick said that to stay away from double sided at first when you're a newbie and just go with the chunker, right? That's what that's your, what you were saying. From yes, stay away have. from double sided when you're a newbie altogether. All the double-sided ones now are designed for higher-end groups. Okay. So if you're a newbie, uh, stay with the chunker at first and then kind of graduate for double-sided later when you have a feel on for what you're doing with your chunkers. One more question. Yes. Do you recommend using competition shears only for competing or is it okay to use it for, on everyday grooms? Uh, is it for me or Nick? Oh, <laughs> okay, well, um, me personally, what I suggest is using the shear that you're comfortable with for competition. Uh, having a separate set of shears for competition and don't use them every day uh, might kind of mess you up in the ring, if you know what I mean. You got to be used and comfortable but with the shears that you want performing the best and those are the ones that you use every day i would you know make sure that you take care of your shears and don't drop them every minute like i do uh and i've done it so many times but shears that i use every day for grooming and that i'm comfortable with and that i know the performance and what they do for me uh 100 are those I prefer to use for my competition dogs. So 
taking care of your shears, having them in good condition, but they're, so they have to be your shears. They fit your hand and that, that you use every day and that you're comfortable with. Nick, your opinion. My opinion is pretty much the same. Um, I say exactly what you say, but it depends on your level of competition. Um, I recommend people to have their scissors that they use every day and they're very comfortable with. But if you're flying all over the place, like if, you're, if we got Pasadena coming up, we have Atlanta coming up, people will buy the same scissor that they are comfortable with and make that their competition set. If you're newer into competing, use the ones you use every day. But when you, if you get to the level where you're flying around competing, they want to know, they already know what that scissor does. They have, the, it's their everyday scissor, but just off to the side for what they do. And I, I see it a lot with different competitors. And I guess it's been in the last couple of years, they're starting to get more specific for each dog. I'm seeing a lot of people start to tailor edges for different dogs that they have. Um, but you have to be comfortable with it. And you're going to be comfortable with what you use all the time. I just talked to Liz about that. That's what she's doing. She has a, a special shear for each dog that she does in the competition. Lynn Johnst Liz Johnston, I'm talking about? Yes. She actually will take a dog, bring the dog in, and say, this is what I'm looking to achieve. And she'll have the scissors modified for that coat. Even if the scissor might not be designed for the dog, she'll say, I like the handle and I like the set for where I'm working with the tuck-up area here. Make it work. And she's altered several scissors for what she wants to have done. Yeah, we just had that conversation in North Carolina, me and Liz. Yeah, now it's getting a lot more serious. But I'm, me, I'm a little bit of an old-fashioned groomer and competitor. I don't overthink things like that much like if if i have a, a straight shear that works great for me that's what i'm going to use for my competition dogs like i don't do that let's say a chunker i wouldn't use for a drop coated dog because i don't like the finish and the chunker would go for a wheaten coat maybe kind of fuzzy wheaten coat um maybe um a doodle coat that's fuzzy. I love using chunkers for that. But if you have silkier, a little bit straighter kind of coat, I don't like using chunkers. So I have a pair or a couple of pairs of blenders with a little bit smaller space between the teeth. And uh, you know, your straights and your curves. We used to do this whole thing with the straight and the curve and the pair of shitty thinning shears. <laughs> And that's it. <laughs> I was just going to say that when you and I learned this, you know, when I started working with different people, because I was at the shows, like, I got to see people like Joey Vergnetti or, or mm -hmm. Allison Foley in the evening time. So when they taught me different things, we had a 4420, we had a, a guide straight, a guide curve, and that was literally our options. It's different for newbies coming in. You have options and technology. When we learn this, they're really like, that's just not the case. And it is so wonderful because I used to use uh, sapphires. You remember those? I do. With my hands? Yep. This big of a shear with the shank like that. And they're like 10 pounds and um, a piece of rubber instead of a stop. Remember that? It was old <laughs> Filipino style. Yes, I do remember yes. that. Yes. So, I mean, it's wonderful that people have choices now, but I think they're taking it a little overboard now. That's what I'm looking at a lot. Well, and I guess that's, you know, a couple different things I wanted to go ahead and touch on here is that the technology and things that people are getting into, they're not being explained different things when they're bought. And I, and I wanted to try and simplify some key points. Um, if any of you are ever going to go to like any of the Barclay shows, we were like, I, I, we do seminars, PowerPoints, and everything put up there. But one thing that's become real popular that I try and explain is a curved chunker. Um, a curved chunker is a very cool tool. It does some amazing things. The thing that people don't explain is that on the inside of the scissor, 
there is a line that is put in there there with first that that line is called a right line. It basically makes the scissor cut. That rot that line is put in there when the scissor is one hundred percent straight. After the scissor is completely made, then they bend it. It cuts and performs beautifully. That line can never be put back in there the same exact way though. There's several we'll call I don't fake processes that can kind of put it back in, but it'll never be the same. So when you get a couple sharpenings in, it's going to start to grab a little bit or feel a little bit grittier on that. And people aren't, when they're selling them, they're not explaining that. The scissor is made straight. Once it's all the way done, then they bend it. It's a beautiful tool, but you're going to, it's not going to last as long as you're straight. So we're seeing that a lot now with people complaining and you know, why can't you put it back in? Well, we can put a, a semi one back in, but the original one, the blade has to be 100% straight to do that. Well, thank you for explaining that because I tried. And again, I only go by my instincts. I don't know any technical stuff like you just explained that it has to be straight and then bend it. I had no idea that's how it's done. But I always knew instinctively that a curved chunker again is a great tool but and and another thing is sharpening process is one thing what you just said but also using them is different you got to move your hand differently when you use chunkers or curved chunkers and people who are used to solid blades or maybe even thinners regular thinners and push their thumb into the blade they're going to be gone in no time and yes people complain they come back and complain i only have them for three months it's not working the blade is nicked the solid blade and none of them are working well yes and we all have to explain the right way to use them and on your part how they made because because of how they made, you can't push the blade into it with the thumb. Then you're going to nick the solid blade and they're never going to be the same. Exactly. You right. nailed it 100%. So, I mean, me on my part being a grooming educator and you on your, it, as a sharpener and somebody who makes scissors, we have to get together like today and explain that to people so they know what they're buying, they know what, what they're getting into, and no misconception there, because it is what it is. You know, why don't you show people how to hold a pair of scissors? I think that would be something that would be very beneficial to anyone watching, because that's pivotal and it'll change just how you, you groom your dogs 10 years from now. All right, give me my scissors. I'll show, I'll take the cast off. <laughs> well, hopefully the steroids are working by now. Yeah, it's okay. So, okay, this is my new product. This is just came in. It is my line. What? Yeah, I'll do, in a minute. Can you see it, Nick? Can you see oh, it, yes. guys? Okay. Yes, I can. So, this is a chunker. It's, um, its name is going to be OG. <laughs> so, um, talking about chunkers, what I was just talking about Here's how they're supposed to be laying in your hand. I can go every direction and they're still, I'm not dropping them. Nice and easy. You put your thumb in and it goes up and down, up and down. If you push your thumb into the blade, the chunkers are going to be messed up in a very short period of time. 
So it is up and down, up and down. Another very important part is the bottom part of your hand needs to be steady and don't move and extremely relaxed. You're holding your blade, your solid blade, with the bottom of your hand. The only thing that moves is your thumb, but it goes up and down without pushing into the blade. That would be the way to use your chunkers and actually all other scissors. But the chunkers will last you the longest if you use them right. Check them out. They'll be out there pretty soon. From a technical standpoint? Ah? From a technical standpoint, that was one of the best explanations I've ever heard. Awesome. Everything that she just went ahead and said to you plays into how they actually will wear. And if you hold them in properly, they wear and you have to sharpen them quicker. How she just explained for you to hold them, the edge will last the absolute longest on the shear itself. That's also very important. You couldn't have explained it any better. It's literally how you hold them, how you use them. You have the control with your hands. Any direction you go on the dog, if you go up this direction, you go down that way, and then just your thumb does the movement. And if, and if you do it that way, the right way, holding the scissors the right, your hand is going to last you exactly 33 years. <laughs> That's the warranty. <laughs> hey, listen, I just went through all this diagnostic stuff, right, with this hand, because I would come home, I take pain pretty well, but I would come home after work, and literally in agony with tears in my eyes. This is how much it hurt. So I went and through this whole diagnostic thing. They did all kinds of imaging, testing with the pins and needles and all kinds of stuff, right? So what I figured out and found out that I don't have a hint of a carpal tunnel, not even close. And there's absolutely no arthritis in my hands. So, hey, holding him right, there's your results. 33 years, no arthritis, no carpal tunnel. And yes, since my thumb is short and I have to move it more and more vigorously, my muscle works a lot harder than, like you say, piano fingers. Yes, my thumb gave out. But it's just now, 33 years, I never had a problem with my hands. So, I mean, uh, jokes aside, if you hold them right and if you use them right, you're saving your shears and your hands, period. Period. That's There's it. One thing you can take away from this today, what she just said, and that's exactly it. It will save your body and it will save your equipment. The last thing you want to do is see someone like me on a regular basis. It costs you money. And then the last thing you want to do is get 20 years into this and your hand sticks like this because you're holding them improperly. And probably by my age, after this many years of grooming, arthritis, carpal tunnel, I see a lot of groomers getting carpal tunnel surgeries, and I'm convinced it's because they're not holding the shear right. Day in and day out, day in and day out. Also, clippers. They could be heavy, like a little heavy for us women to hold all day and maneuver and work with it. Uh, also holding your clippers the right way. Uh, I think I'm going to show it too today if we have any clippers. Do we guys? Any clippers around here? Oh, that's fine. Corded is fine. So yes, using your, sh your clippers and shears in your hand, holding them correctly is going to save your hand. And oh, wow, look at this. I found something like this, look. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is cute. This looks like uh, the hairdresser she, uh, clippers. So holding your clippers, guys, too, scissors and clippers. And next, Nick, we're talking hand stripping. <laughs> so you're holding your clippers like a pencil. You're manipulating your clipper, no matter how heavy or light it is, with your fingers 
and not so much your wrist or your elbow. And that is the best way to get fast into some hidden parts of the dog as well and also save your hand. So holding the clippers is also very important, but that's just a couple of minutes about the clipper. Do we have any questions? Where's Nick? Oh, there's Nick. Huh? We do. I'm ambidextrous and have a hard time with some of the finger supports that are on shears. Any suggestions? Nick, do you see the question? She's ambidextrous and she has a hard time with some of the finger holes. Is that what I heard? My wife has been grooming for years and is teaching me. Um, I'm a dexterous and have a hard time with some of the finger supports that's, that's on Shear's suggestions. Well, I, I actually can answer that one. I'm ambidextrous myself. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm actually left-handed. Um, everything I do in the world is left-handed. And so anyone that's left-handed always gets sent to me to work with. When you are ambidextrous like that, how your mind works, you need to pick a side. You need to pick left or right. I chose right because there was more options for me. When I learned how to groom, the left and it says was there. So I learned right groom everything right-handed. Um, the biggest suggestion the ambidextrous you can stick to it because you're tricking your brain each time. Is it Nick Nick's internet? Okay, what was the last thing you heard from that? <laughs> uh, that you were saying about uh, choosing the side because you're tricking your brain different things every time. Scissors between left-handed or right-handed are completely backwards. The pressure you put on your left hand to your right hand is backwards to each one. So if you bounce back and forth, you're going to have issues. I would just pick one side. And just stick with it. Yes. All right, cool. So uh, now I'm thinking maybe I have to learn how to do things with the left hand. I don't know if that's possible. I'll, I'll teach you. Are you sure? Are you sure it's possible? <laughs> Nick, I can't wipe my ass with my life, left hand. I'm telling you, I am so righty. It's <laughs> not even funny. So now that this happened, it scared me really badly. Like it's. It, it's scary. So I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Somebody says, well, train your left hand. Is it possible? Legit question. It's, it depends on your motor skills. Um, I think that someone like you who's been doing this a long time, I think that you can go ahead and learn to operate scissors with your left hand. Um, I think it depends on your, your, how long you've been grooming and your will and drive to do it. Um, I use everything right-handed when it comes to scissors, um, but I, I'm left-handed, so it just depends on... Uh, right. Well, so it is possible. You just, okay, so it is possible you just have to be driven enough. Yes. All right, maybe I'll try. We got a lot of questions. Let me keep going. Yeah, let's do, let's do questions. All right. What is your favorite type and size of shear? Oh, Nick is back. What is, uh, what is your favorite type and size of shear, Nick? Do you have one? No. There's, I, I, I basically. Oh, no. 
Is it is it Nick's connection? Yeah. Hmm. Oh crap. Yeah. Can you hear me, Nick? I can. I don't know why it's doing that. It says I have good internet. Snowstorm. Yeah, we're not in the beautiful sunshine state like you are, unfortunately. But I'm sure that's what it is. When we were having some serious hurricane things going on here, that's the problem we have with connection sometimes. So bear with us, guys. We can't do any, anything with the weather. We're just going to be coming back every time. <laughs> so your favorite shear and size, you don't have one. I, I look at a scissor, either I use grab a beveled edge scissor for what I'm doing or a convict edge scissor. Um, I did not take on grooming to the level that you did, to the to mastery of what you did. I got fortunate enough to be trained and work with people that are, that are in this industry. So I've never done a lot of the high end or competition aspects you have, but I can pick up a 10 inch scissor and do the same thing as a six inch scissor. I focus more on the edge that's on it for what I'm doing. And um, I don't groom dogs anymore. All of my friends are groomers. They groom my dogs. <laughs> okay. What kind of dogs do you have? Do you still Currently, have show dogs? I, I have one. Um, it was supposed to be a show dog. Then COVID hit, so it didn't happen. So uh, right. I'm down to a, a Norwich Terrier and a Corgi. Okay. All short-legged little cute things. I'm, I'm done with big dogs. I've had big dogs my whole life. Now get in the car and we just go. Right. <laughs> Take out of the crate, put it in the ring. Yep. Strip the dog at home and just do nothing at the show. A little bit of talk, maybe. That's exactly <laughs> it. Simple and easy. Right. Good for you. I'm looking for that. And that, uh, just now, past 10 years, I'm getting into carry blues. Okay. Lots of, yes, but lots of grooming. <laughs> and a big dog, too. I'm all medium size, but it's not a little dog. But anyways, we have a lot of questions for you. Nina, more, more, must. Okay, as a lefty, it's hard to find shears. Um, do you, Nick, have a brand you recommend for lefties? Your most versatile companies out there for lefties are going to be Kenchi and Guide. They have the biggest selection. Okay. Almost all scissor companies have a line. So if, if there's a scissor you like, they have something small, but Kenchi and Guide has the most. Okay. And um, can you as a lefty use right-handed shears and be successful? As long as you use them in your right hand. Right, so you cannot, <laughs> okay, so you cannot use a right-handed shear in your left hand and be successful. Correct. Okay, got it. I have, this is a right-handed scissor. This is a left-handed scissor. I don't know. On this scissor, compared to one. When the other hand, it actually bends the teeth on it. That's what I would think, yeah. Waiting for Nick again with that snowstorm. I, I want to be there for like a day in that snowstorm. You can have it all, all of it. Hey, I have many reasons for that. One, born and raised in Ukraine. I miss it very much. Two, I have so much beautiful clothes for that. So much, and it just hangs there in my closet. I never even touch it. I go, yeah. and especially with COVID where I didn't travel for two years I'm looking at it and like I gotta go somewhere where there's lots of snow I miss it
Caitlin Reed. Oh, I know who Caitlin is. She scissors a very okay, different way. She, uh, Caitlin scissors a very different way. Which, um, she, we lost Nick again? Yeah, he's talking. Okay. Which, uh, Caitlin had an injury to her hand, but she still loved grooming so much that she figured out a way to scissor of a very different way, holding the shears, direction, she scissors are very different than we all used to. And um, the question is not on the screen. Aha, uh -huh, there it is. So with my hand injury, Nick is not there, right? He's trying to get in. Can you go back to Caitlin's? Yes. With my hand injury, it's hard to find um, things that work. I wish I could hold a shear properly, but it just isn't possible. Do you have any suggestions for those of us that have such limitations? Okay, sorry about that. I switched over to my cell phone to see if that makes a difference. Um, Looks like it does. Now. Looks like it does make a difference. Absolutely. So, so go ahead and, and ask me that question again. Okay, Caitlin, Nina, let's read it again. Okay, with my hand injury, it's hard to find things that work. I wish I could hold a shear properly, but it is just not it just isn't possible. Do you have any suggestions for those of us that have such limitations? My best suggestion on that, especially when it comes to any sort of hand injury, is everyone's hand is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Pick a big grooming show, go to it, and try every scissor that you can think of. Um, yep. Most Boost will have stuff you can test it on. And I know it's not like doing a, a a real dog, but if you find someone that you know in the industry, such as myself or as Pina or somebody that has a bunch of knowledge, try them all out and then go ask someone. I found this. Do you think it'll work for me? And what reason behind it is? But when you have a hand injury, there's a million kinds of scissors. Just go to a giant show and walk around and start playing with them. From a groomer's point of view, thank you, Nick. Yeah, that's a great, because that's exactly what I do. If somebody asks me, what would you suggest for shears for me? I would always say, if you have an opportunity to go to a trade show, go to a trade show first. Don't buy anything online yet. Try and try and try. And then you can go back home and buy something online that you liked at the show. But you really have to put that shear in your hands and see how it is working for you but for Caitlin from a groomer's point of view that grooms every day I would think that the biggest and and I think the best suggestion I could give you Caitlin is to find a level um, shank shears not not off my god my brain is not working even handled offset even handled offset. I would think that for Caitlin, even handled would be much more comfortable. What do you think? You know Caitlin, right? I, I do. Um, yeah. Also, when it comes to hand injuries, a convex scissor will always be smoother and easier on the hand. Okay. That I didn't know. There you go. I hope we can help Caitlin. Yeah, even would be much better, I think, because I think she scissors this way. Down, yeah, even would be probably more comfortable. All right, next, next one, Nin. Uh, what shears are the best for scissoring up? I'd say any. What do you say? Any. Right. Personal preference. You can right. take the top five people from last year and sit them down and say, show me your best scissor and they're all gonna pull out something different. Yeah, definitely. I know it's, Defin it's not, it doesn't help answer the question, but it's gonna be what you become comfortable with. 
that's what it's going to be. It's going to be the best one. And also, I think the best one to scissor up would be straight shear, not curve. Yes. Yes, completely agree. So straight and whatever you're comfortable with. Do we have any more? I'm in love with my little chunkers. I can't wait to see them. Mm, I'll bring them to, where are you, Pasadena? I'll be in Pasadena, yes. I'll be there the whole weekend. I'll bring him to show you. Perfect. All of them. Yep. Myra, when and how often should we have our different shears sharpened? A lot of different things to say on that. Yes. I would guess <clears throat> so. A lot of shops. <clears throat> boy, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a couple different stories to, to answer that. A lot of shops, we do mobile sharpening too as well. We have rigs that go around two shops. I think we service six to 800 shops and we sharpen and drop off supplies. We're there about every six weeks. A lot of groomers have their scissors sharpened every six weeks. Maintenance depends on those two as well. Um, I had two grooming shops buy the same exact scissor in the same town. Um, one person chose to keep the convex edge on them, the other one went with the beveled edge. The convex edge ones lasted three times as long as the other ones for they were worn out um, because of how they're, they're maintained. How you handle scissors, people who don't drop them, people who are very meticulous with the coat being clean. I know some groomers, when we go to see them, they only get two or three shears sharpened. I know some, when we see them, they hand their whole entire pile of scissors <laughs> over to be done. Um, so I guess six weeks or longer, and it's going to depend on you. Um, with that being said, um, I brought home one of my, our, our things here. We get asked all the time, well, you're in Michigan, I'm out in California. Who's someone that I should go ahead and use for sharpening work? And I, and I tell people that if you take 10 sharpeners and put them all in the same room, they'll all tell you that they're all better than everyone else and no one knows what they're doing. And I'm sure you've heard that over the years. <laughs> So what I tell people, if wherever you're at, if you're looking for a scissor sharpener, first thing, just because they sell the brand of scissors does not mean they're authorized to sharpen them. If you ever want to know any sharpener out there, they get little pieces of paper like this right here. And this one's from Chris, Chris Christensen. And this basically states that if my company sharpens it and messes it up, Chris Christensen will stand behind it. All your good sharpeners out there have those pieces of paper. Okay. Well, I didn't know that either. That is great to know, guys. So if you're looking for a good sharpener, you need to look for one of those papers. If you're looking, yes. for, a if you're looking for a good groomer, you need to look for a paper of master grooming certification, whatever company it is. I think that's a good indication of somebody doing a better job than somebody who doesn't have that paper. Completely agree. Yep. So if you guys are looking, look for certification. It's not just papers. We cannot just buy them here. We have to work for it. And that means something. All right, next. What is a proper care for shears and blades? How often to clean? and how often to oil. I wish I would have grabbed some at the shop today when I was there. This is, a, this is a big one. So when you buy a pair of scissors and they come in a box, you will see a tube of oil inside of that box. That oil that's in there is not technically designed as scissor oil. It is a storage oil. If you put it on the scissor, you'll still see it. When you groom a dog, that oil attracts dirt and hair. Dirt and hair, go they dull a scissor out. Proper scissor oil actually goes on as a liquid and then it dries and it leaves a film behind that is the oil. It's $8, they come in a small little tube and we use them on every scissor we sharpen and one of those tubes will last me four or five months. Um, so this oil that comes with the scissors you buy are designed more for storage and cleaning. You put it on there, you put them away, that's going to happen. You pull them out, you wipe the excess oil off, and you use this. It's an evaporating oil. 
Um, and if you want, I can go ahead and get you that information if they want to put it in the comments or something later, what the exact companies are that have those. Um, I don't like sharpening my own scissors. I, 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 I despise it. So I clean my stuff every day. Are groomers going to do that? No. No. But how the oil is designed, if you use that evaporating oil every day on them, the edge will last longer. So you guys uh, do sell the evapor blah, 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 oil. Yes. <laughs> Evapor evaporating. Okay, so you, you can all guys buy it at Whitman's. They definitely have it. And if you want to search other companies, Nick is uh, gracious enough to give you other companies that sell that oil. I've always knew that Scissor oil is a completely different thing than what you say, maintenance oil or clipper oil. Is that true? Completely true. Um, you can put clipper oil on a pair of scissors. It's not going to hurt it. It'll hurt it once you start grooming a dog. It'll pull all of the hair into the cutting edge and it will dull it. If you put it on there for a storage reason or you just, just want to oil it, you need to clean it all off and not necessarily all on the blade. You need to get in between your pivot point in here. This is where it sits. This is where the damage comes from as it gets down in here and it stays in there. You wanna get that out. Um, so the evaporating oil for a grooming shop, if you keep the cap on it so it doesn't evaporate, it'll last you a year. Yeah, it's in the name that I can't pronounce. So put the cap on people, <laughs> keep it closed. Next question. Okay, um, Irina, uh, hit a good point being comfortable with, you, with your own tools. Uh, oh, I hit a good point, okay. My question is, how do you pass the skill set to an apprentice and help them find their own tools? Um, first of all, an apprentice or a student has to learn how to scissor hair with the shittiest, heaviest pair of scissors that ever existed first. And hold that shear properly in front of my hand, in front of my face. Once I see you can operate that heavy, bad shear, then I'm gonna let you try a hundred different kinds in your hand with the dog on the table and see what feels the extension of your hand. See what feels like you don't have anything in your hand at all. That's how you choose your scissors. Your other tools, you might not have many choices, but scissors are very important in your hand. You have to feel like it's an extension of your body. Like you don't feel it in your hand as a foreign subject. That's your perfect tool when you get that feeling. Do you hear me, Nick? Oh, I hear you. And actually, I, I agree with you. I like your analogy there. The, the, the shittiest scissor that you can have, use that one, because you're not wrong. If you can learn to do a breed profile and a breed outline with a, a heavy, older scissor like that, when you gravitate towards a better style of scissor, you're going to have it all, and you're, you're going to your grooms are going to be amazing. I, yeah, and that's the that's the next level when you go and choose when you already have the skill set in your hands with the shittiest one, then the next level is you go and choose. You now have a luxury. I'm gonna let you go choose your better tool. And that's when you have to look for that feeling. Close your eyes, put that scissor in your hand and move it, move it in your hand. And if you don't feel like you have something foreign in your hand, that's your tool. It has to be there. You have to forget you have a pair of shears in your hand when you're grooming. That's your perfect scissor. No matter what I'm it is. I'm going to you into the booth to, to sell scissors from now on. That's just the best <laughs> I can learn <laughs> Well, I could sell. I could sell. I know I can sell. But I can only sell what I like. Fair. 
something I don't like, I can't sell. But if I like something, I'd, I'll sell all of it. You'll be out of it in like 30 minutes. I'm the same way. We carry everything, but people, when they ask my recommendation, that doesn't mean I recommend everything we carry. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's a business. You got to carry what people like. Doesn't mean that you have to like it. Never. That's why for a few years now, I do not represent any companies. None. Zero. And I've been with Oster. I've been with Artero. Um, and other small companies in the beginning, and I do not want to do that. If I like a tool or a product, I will sell it without being representing the company or working for the company, I don't care. And that's probably the best way to sell things <laughs> for people because I just can't sell what I don't like. All right, we got a new, a next question, guys. Um, huh? Comment. It's a comment. That's how I ended up with double swivel shears. Picked one up, and it is instantly didn't hurt. I have fibromyalgia, so not hurting is a huge priority. Absolutely. This, you, you're looking for a feeling. You're looking for a feeling, whatever it is, whether it's a swivel or not swivel, um, uh, anything, anything that feels right in your hand is what your tool is. Next, Irina, do you personally use scissor rings and why? I do not. If you hold your shear correctly, you'd never need uh, a, a, a thumb ring, is my opinion. Your thumb has to be at the edge of a ring, of a thumb ring, and uh, it shouldn't go anywhere if your scissor is the right way in your right way in your hand. Okay, I'm gonna take my cast off again. <laughs> you see where my thumb is? I think it's a little blurry. Bring it back. Bring it back. Okay, there you go. It is not even in. And that's how I hold all my shears. So rings, um, I don't need rings. Okay, cast back on. Where's Nick? We lost Nick again. Oh, I'm still here. Okay. I didn't see you on the screen. All right, so... What do you think about the, the thumb rings or finger rings in, in shears? Do you think it's a good idea when people just start? Or do you think they need to be starting the right way and never need them? I think that's, that's kind of a loaded question. I think it that is. In, the thumb, in the thumb hole, if you shrink the hole down smaller, it teaches them not to put their thumb all the way through. Um, on all of my shears, I don't have inserts except for on Filipino style scissors. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they're, these aren't mine. I grabbed these out of the showroom, but these holes are like three times the size of my hand. I grew up with Bouvier's. Bouvier hair, a Filipino thick style scissor, will cut right through the coat very easily, but I lose control with my hand on it. So I put inserts in the Filipino style. All the rest of them, I do not have inserts in. Yeah, me neither. But I recommend several people who are starting who take their thumb and push it through the scissor. We shrink the hole down so only their tip will, the, the, the thumb will fit in there. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. When you just start and your thumb rides right up in that hole, that will probably make um, your thumb get used to being at the edge. Yeah. Yes. But I, I don't, look, my thumbs are huge. They're like drumsticks. Look. <laughs> Look at that. So I don't need, I never needed one. <laughs> but if you, jokes aside, if you need to get used to holding it at the edge, then yeah, rings are fine. Uh, next question. I just lost my AirPod. It just fell out of my head and my foot. Oh, oh, got it. Okay. 
And my ears are tiny, so AirPods fall out. Okay, next question. What is the next Michigan show that Whitman's will be at? Um, well, we actually have our own grooming show. And it's next week. And next it's week? It's held in Novi, huh. Michigan. How come I don't know about it? Where is it? Is it's, a, it's a smaller scale. We actually started it in 2019 with a three-year plan to be sanctioned. So 2019 mm -hmm. went well. Uh, COVID hit, so 2020 and 2021, we couldn't hold it. And so we're, we're holding it again this year. We actually hold it in conjunction with a giant AKC dog show. Mm -hmm. So people can see the breeds and the breed standards. Um, so it was a three year plan. Um, next year, everything should be sanctioned. So next year is the plan for the, the to make it extremely big. So yeah, awesome. next week, actually, Novi, Michigan. Well, have fun. Good luck over there. Go see them, guys. Next one, next. I think we're good. We're good. So next, I want to talk about hand stripping okay. and hand stripping tools. Happens to be my passion. I'm not famous out there for hand stripping dogs, but uh, every day of my life, I get anywhere from two to four hand stripping dogs a day in the shop that I groom at. That one. Two, I absolutely love hand stripping. I love hand stripping dogs, most of the breeds. Um, and there's misconception out there. See if you agree with me, Nick. I know you hand strip a lot. <clears throat> Did you have to have dandies too? My parents have dandies. Right, right. I saw him at Whitman's booth a few times. So yep. dandies are hand strip dogs, a combination actually, but the backs are hand strip. So there is a huge misconception in my own opinion out there that hand stripping kills your hands. I think scissoring kills my hands more than hand stripping. I never actually thought of hand stripping uh, a very difficult tool or skill that will kill my hands. Uh, for me, first of all, I enjoy it very much. And for me, my hands don't feel any... Um, strain for hand stripping what is it am i doing it wrong am i doing it right what do you think because i keep on teaching people on how to hand strip and enjoy it and a lot of them just tell me no right off the bat because oh no i i don't want my hands to die for me it has never been that what do you think i think that you hit a great topic I think that you're doing it correctly. I think uh, stripping is starting to make a comeback for some reason in our industry lately. But for years, it's always been it hurts my hand, it hurts my hand. And when you sit yep. down and work with people with tools that we sell, and when lots of them do it, it would hurt my hand. I started stripping, I don't want to say later in life, but I started with scissors first. Um, I was always around people to strip dogs. So, like, you know with my dad watching my dad with the dandies and learning more different things like um steve russell has scotties mm -hmm. Carlos, um, I, I worked with him a little bit with different things they explained to me when i started that you're doing it wrong completely and how to hold your hand because your hands are going to hurt and even though i haven't been doing it long those micro adjustments that i made my hands do not hurt if i strip dogs yeah me neither you know what I did? I cheese grated uh, Peter Green years ago. You know what cheese grating yeah. is? Okay. Yes. I was the cheese grater. <laughs> On his private parts. So basically, young 18, 19 year old Russian doesn't really speak English that well. I was literally stalking him at the shows in New York area. He was still showing and I would stand there and watch. A couple of times he got really unhappy with me and screamed at me because I was right there. Like I was right there. And um, what I was watching is the outline and profile of the dogs that he was grooming, but I was also mesmerized by the way he used his fingers on detail work. 
And that's what I, I was drooling. The drool was coming down my throat and, and he didn't like that, right? But I didn't give a crap because I needed to learn. So <clears throat> that I'm using to this day. And I think that it's so, you use it so gentle that there's no way that your hand is going to work when you're doing it like that. It, there's pretty much no strength that I put in my hands by pulling, tipping the coat, shaping it, and detailing it. That's one part of it where I don't see any damage to the hand happening. What do you say? I completely agree with that. Um, one thing that I really see um, in the booth when people come in, people never know the difference, it seems, between stripping carding carding how to hold the tools differently between stripping and carding you know when you do stripping work with a tool the motion behind so many people roll their wrist when they do it oh yeah you want to keep it, you want to keep it straight and it's a it's a it's a motion it's just a motion of your arm moving you don't want to bend it or vary it um at all and if you if you do that with the tools that you have they're going to go ahead and, and work a lot better for you when you buy stripping tools if you go to any show or booth ask someone who strips dogs to explain the tools to you because the first question i come up someone comes in and tells me i need to strip a dog honestly 60 percent of the time i sell them a carding tool right. I ask them, the carding, and they don't know what i'm talking about so after right. explaining it to them they walk out with the carding tool yeah because most of the time um i need to strip uh an english cocker no you don't need to strip an english cocker so, but they use that word. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So, yeah, that needs to be explained. I think um, lots of us need to go to all these shows and explain these things to people. Maybe even have, I have this crazy idea for a while now, get all kinds of different specialists in the industry, including you, uh, me as a scissor, or maybe somebody who hand strips, somebody who does rustic coats who knows how to do rustic coats anymore like your pumis like your corded dogs like your legato ramaniolo i mean all those rustic coats nobody knows how to bathe them dry them and groom them so get all these people kind of like uh, remember that michael jackson thing yeah. Where, where everybody was thinking, is singing together. I think we should be teaching together. Uh, all different specialists in different areas of the industry in one big, huge event at the same time. And I also, agree. I it, yeah, and also people need to be asking us questions live, not after the event. Not in the break, but as we are talking. Because you know what I find? I teach a lot. So when we have this thing where we do our presentation, whatever we're doing, and then at the end, people are allowed to ask questions. I think more than half the people forgot what they wanted to ask while I was doing something on stage. And that... Definitely. And that kind of diminishes the, the quality of education a little bit. Because if somebody came to a, an event and paid money, whatever money it is, it doesn't matter. 50 bucks or 500 bucks is still money. We still busted our asses for that amount of money. Then they need to get all 1,000% of the education they came to get. And it's like, it's like a dream. I don't think, it, I don't know if it's feasible to do it, but I think we should have 10 different people with different specialties teaching in one event, like all day or maybe two day event where people could learn about scissors, sharpening, how to hold them. Uh, us groomers, as you show in the technical stuff, grabbing those tools and showing them on live dogs i mean it would be so educational what you think about think, that Nick? i think we can do it i think, I think we know so. enough people actually that we could do that right we have a connection when, when you were talking about the corded breeds i instantly thought of someone i grew up with that's what they do 
But then I right. thought to myself, that's the only person I know. Off the right. Top of my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I groom a lot of pumis. Why? Because nobody else does in yes. my area. Uh, but it's so much fun. It's so much fun. Hornadas. Lulu Rodriguez says, Hornadas, we should do that event at Hornadas at the same time. Actually, Hornadas is very similar to what I'm talking about, except we have a couple of people on stage at each section, right? At each uh, session, better yet. But Lulu, think about it. We can do one big Artero event with something like that. Hornadas are good too like that, but we don't have sharpeners. We don't have people that actually make scissors or tools speaking at Hornadas, which maybe is a good idea. I'm just throwing shit out there, Lulu. Just think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, another thing that, you know, talking about the different worlds, like, you know, you and I come from the AKC world. A lot of people come to me now in the grooming world and they want to know how to do something with a certain breed of dog. And you'll hear people say, go to a dog show, go to a dog show. If anyone watching, I want to give you some really big advice if you go to a dog show. If you go to a dog show and you see someone showing and handling the dogs, leave them alone. Wait till you know that they're not busy and, and politely go, I really would like to ask some questions. I know that you're busy. When is some time that I can speak with you? If you're polite like that, they will probably tell you when they have time. Also, if you want to learn these different breed trims, they'll take you on as an assistant for different shows, but just know you're gonna bust your ass. For and almost no will, money. For no, yeah, for no money. Mm -hmm. But yep. they will teach you that. But so many groomers get so excited and they go into a dog show and they go, I love your dog, I love your Bashan, I love how it looks, let me see it. And you killed any chance you had of ever learning from them because they're there to do a job. That's exactly what I say. Do you see the reason I'm smiling? Those are the words that always come out of my mouth. If somebody's asking me about AKC, oh, how do I learn about this breed or that breed? Exactly what you're saying. Like go to the dog show. Don't speak to them until they're done with their day. Never come and speak to them because you're going to have your head bitten off and have yep. no chance to talk to them for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> so we're 100% in agreement in that. Yes, you speak to those people, they're knowledgeable. You're not gonna get more knowledge than you will get out of the breeder or handler of a specific breed that you're interested in. But don't go interrupt them when they get those dogs ready. You might. No, I, my own friends will yell at me, I'll come by and go, I got a yeah. question. And they'll say, Nick, I'm, I will see you at six o'clock. Yeah, get the hell away from here. Yeah, absolutely. I do too. I mean, at PCA, you've seen me at PCA. I get a dog. I get a dog on the table at seven in the morning, and I leave the building at eleven at night. So they just go off on, off on my table, and a lot of people and come. They're kicking us out of the building. Yes, we're leaving at eleven because they're closing the building. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But then we go back where the motorhomes are and groom there with the fl flashlights. I have pictures and videos of that from BCA. <laughs> from, that's, when, uh, that's when all the, the wine comes out. That's what I remember from PCA. The wine, the, the, wine, the pizza, the uh, beer, everything. Yeah. Yes. Cold water because they don't have any water. Did you know that? Outside, they don't have any water to bathe dogs at Purina yep. Farms. You have to go inside. But they just threw us out and we have to do something, so cold water out of a pitcher, bathing dogs. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun, but it is what it is. Going back to confirmation and everything, yes, even at PCA, if you wanna ask me a question, that's totally fine. I will politely tell you to go love yourself right now but then I'll tell you the time to come back where we can talk. And that's with everyone at AKC shows. So have respect for their work and their job. It's intense. They have to get those dogs ready in time in that ring and everyone wants to win. So they're also very 
anxiety ridden most of the time. But then of course go back at six o'clock and ask your questions. That is a great advice, Nick, because people get discouraged when they yes. don't know how to do that. What's your favorite AKC dog show to go to? PCA is one of my favorites. Um, I also love, uh, there's a show in Ohio, Canfield. You've yes. been there, right? I love that show for some reason. Those are probably the only two. I hate Westminster, freaking hate it. I know that it's a great show. It's great to watch on TV. When, yes. you actu <laughs> when you're actually there working, it's probably the, one of the worst experience at the dog show I've ever had. As a groomer and a helper and an assistant, I never showed a dog at Westminster, but I've been there to help and groom and everything. Horrible. I don't like it. Canfield, I love. I've been to Canfield many times. I might say my favorite show would have to be PCA, but I love Purina Farms. My favorite time is when they had it out in Salisbury, Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, that was my, I my, love my Salisbury. I loved Salisbury. I w we went to Salisbury. I started going to PCA in 2008, which is, I mean, quite a few years. But we started there in Maryland, and I absolutely loved it. I was kind of upset when they moved it. I do love Purina Farms, but Maryland was better. Totally agree with you. Uh, Lori Craig. Uh, will Pina be doing... Grooming competition. Yes, I am, and Nick and Whitman's are sponsoring it this year, guys. My grooming competition for poodles. Yes, Lori, please come. We're going to have so much fun. Okay. No more questions. Yes, there's going to be a grooming competition. Whitman's is one of the sponsors. Thank you very much. Uh, all the proceeds from um, entry fees go to the breed club, hopefully for um, uh, health testing fund. And we have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we have wonderful time at PCA Poodle. Just Poodles is what it's called. Uh, you can do poodles only, pet trims, show trims, anything you want. Uh, you have only two divisions, amateur and professionals. And it's my rules. I came up with the rules. Originally, it's mine and Michael Lamb and Lulu. We kind of, my idea, but we both got in and set it up. I think it's been seven years now. And guys, trust me, you get so much more time to groom those poodles. You get an assist, you get an assistant to hold the head while you're spraying up. You could walk in that ring with feet, tail, and face already done. So all of it is towards having fun and enjoying grooming poodles. And also making money for the club. So it's a wonderful event. Do you know? What day that is, yes, it is on Monday. I believe it's April 25th. Monday, April 25th. In Purina Farms. The PCA? PCA, yes. Poodle Club of America National Specialty. Question. Does your rules allow color sure Lori if it's you freaking color the whole dog just give me a poodle trim <laughs> Lori uh, in all seriousness if it's a poodle and it's done in a poodle trim any color let's make it fun I want to see lots of color this year now I'm curious Right? I, me too. Listen, we're open for anything. All I want them to look like poodles. Not doodles. Poodles. 
and then anything, anything goes. That's a, a big thing you see with different breeds that people will, you know, color their Bashans or different things and, you know, they'll go, well, I can't, I can't compete with it. And that's, I get the competition aspect when they're, when they're doing the creative style and the other different colors, but I never understood to me when you, when you take your dog and make it blue or green or whatever your color is, it doesn't change what you're cutting. It doesn't change the breed profile. It doesn't change what the dog is. So it's, that's always, it's always mystified me over the years. Right. Well, I feel a little differently about that. What I want to see as a judge for a grooming competition is um, a purebred dog that looks like a special that can go on the ground and win best in show. Fair. That's what I'm looking for. If it's a Bichon, it needs to look like uh, the best Bichon I've ever seen. Even if it doesn't go on the ground and move, it needs to stand there looking like a best in show winning special. When there's a, a, a blue tail, he can't go down and show and win best in show. I agree with you, technically, skill-wise, nothing changes. You still groom a dog, you still use your scissor, you still put the dog in the, in the breed profile haircut, yes. But I wanna, Im I wanna imagine that dog right there with the red, white, and blue ribbon winning best in show. That's what I wanna see in the competition ring. That's one thing, actually, you know, doing all these different shows over the years, I've, I've been close enough to hear many of your critiques that you've given over time. And that's one thing I enjoy about you. A lot of groomers, they groom a dog on the table and it's not designed to get down and move. And you can see a lot of things change in the structure when they, when they go and get it down. With my background from the AKC world, I've watched you judge that way and watched you explain that to different people and stuff. And that's actually been a really a, a breath of fresh air Oh, thank you. Because I've watched several judges not do that and not have the background and the AKC aspect. So I, I think it's great that you do that part of it. Well, the, uh, the most kind of disappointing thing that I, or, or that I hear and see out there in grooming competitions is, um, well, this is competition grooming. It's got nothing to do with show grooming. To me, it's the same thing. There is difference, but not in the outline and not in the way the dog is looking. You always have to imagine putting that dog on the, t on the ground and move him. Yes, I always think that way when I look at the dog on the table. But the only difference is, is technical stuff. Like your grooming competition dog has to be technically sound. Your show dog doesn't have to be. And that's the only two differences. That's the only one difference that I see between a special, that a best in show special, and a dog on the grooming table for grooming competition. On, you know, open level, that's what I want to see. All the lower levels, that should be their goal. That should be their light at the end of the tunnel. That best in show looking dog. But it's not different. I think it's the outline, the breed profile, the breed essence, essence is identical, except technically you gotta groom a better dog grooming wise on the grooming table than you do in the, in the show ring. I mean, I could whack a carry blue in 15 minutes, put it in the ring and it could go best of winners. Nobody's looking for each hair out of place or not. Grooming competition, they do, but everything else is the same. That's I what I. You. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> well, and I, and I like that you brought that up. You can always tell when you see someone who's got a a dog that whether it's borrowed or theirs that they've shown, and then they get into the open level. You can walk around the ring before they start grooming and you can just see the beauty in these dogs and you go, I can't wait to see what this is going to look like, what their talent is with it, because you see several dogs. Like, I'll, I'll go and I'll recognize the special that yeah, I've seen me out too. Of and I'll go, well, I know what this dog looks like. What are you going to do with it? So I always, I always look forward to seeing that. Well, in North Carolina, when we were there together, I recognized the dog in the ring. I didn't even know 
the girl who was grooming the dog. I came and asked her if that was Rocky, and she said, yes, how do you know? I'm like, I recognize the dog. <laughs> and I know what he looks like. I know how long his neck is. I know how big his rear angles are. I know the dog. Like, I recognize him in the ring without even knowing you. Yep. Let's see what you can do. <laughs> Yeah, so it's very true. I recognize dogs better than people always. It's the story of my life. But we looking for um, a breed essence. Again, the only difference is for me, technically sound. Eh, it could be the same technically sound if it's a big, huge special, but it doesn't have to be in the show ring. But that outline and essence has to be the same on the table and on the ground and that's what i'm looking for and um if that gets to that point it'll be a happy day in the show in in the grooming competition i go I, i'm judging in pasadena and then i'm judging in atlanta and i'm very excited to judge because i always I'm exciting, excited to see beautiful dogs, what people can do, how can I help if, I, if they need help and all of that. But I always want to turn around, look at the ring and say, oh, holy shit. And can't take my eyes off of the dog. That hasn't happened in a while. I, I'm looking forward to that. You know what I'm saying, right? I do and I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> um, there was there was an individual um, two years ago, three years ago, and you see, you know, the grooming competitions. I see people competing all the time. I see people grooming dogs because the APC shows all the time. I was walking by the ring, um, and I saw someone stripping a dog, and I stopped and I stood there. Someone walked by, and I asked who that was because I could see what they were doing. And I don't see that very often, like seeing that, like it literally stopped me in my tracks. There, there was a Scotty they were working on. Right. Um, and I just, and it's been great watching that person with their career, how, what, what's happened with them since then. I know exactly what you're talking about. I literally stopped to watch them because you can just see that and see what it's going to be afterwards. Yeah, it doesn't really happen that often. But when you see that, when I see that, it makes me happy. That thing makes me more happy than that take my breath away and i can't take my eyes. i walk this way but my eyes go still to that dog i go that way i still can't take my eyes off of the dog i want to see that at every show multiple times that's where that level has to go i haven't for a while maybe it's covid we haven't been anywhere <laughs> yeah. well we'll see with california coming up yeah um, it's also too with like the different grooming shows out there the people watching like you know us talking back and forth here today is just to, to ask different questions and stuff we give seminars at these shows that are very technical like they have powerpoints they have breakdowns different things of that nature so like not just this what i what i what i specialize in they have things for a lot of different other aspects too so mm -hmm. anyone watching at home if you want to know more in your industry start going to grooming shows whether or not and you pick something up from the seminar you're going to meet someone somewhere at some point that's going to take absolutely. your knowledge absolutely absolutely and nowadays you can find a show almost in every part of the country so you don't have to travel that far almost every yes. part of the country has a show during the year or two or three so go find i this question is actually asked very often. Where can people go online to find all these shows that are happening in the country? Is there one, do you know if there's one place they can go and see the locations and dates of the shows and competitions? So there's not necessarily one for the grooming shows. Um, Barkley has a lot of the grooming shows. Right. Well, you can go to Barclay, yeah, but there's other, like yours. I didn't know about yours next week. Do you so, know what I mean? 
And I know exactly what you mean. It's it's tough. There are basically, if you want to know about all the individual shows, find a Facebook group that is about grooming dogs and ask. I'm from California, or I'm here. What grooming shows are around? And everyone loves to talk on Facebook. Twenty people. Good idea. Yes. About what shows are in that area? Because there's. 13, 14 grooming shows in the U.S.? I, th I think more. I think about 16. Last I, I counted. Time. Last I counted, it was about 16. But it was I'm before after, COVID. After we get done, I'm going to count them. Now I'm curious. Yep, yep. But they are huh? staggered all we'll over the U.S. I can't hear you. We'll make a page. Oh, we'll make a page. We'll make a page for all of the shows to be on so a person could go and just look at all of them. Perfect. Yep. If someone wants to know about AKC shows, um, infodog.com. Yes, infodog.com has all of them. There's a map of the whole country. You can click on the place where you are and they'll show you all the shows. So that's AKC. But we're going we're gonna to try and make a page for all the grooming shows i think that's a great idea yeah yeah awesome we had a question that we didn't answer uh-huh if someone wants to improve their scissoring technique skills what will you tell them um i would tell you if you're not sure by yourself uh of what you're doing and how to improve your skills find a mentor find somebody that can work with you and show you and put your fingers in the right holes. I don't know if it sounds right, but that's what it is. What do you think, Nick? Find somebody to show you, find somebody to train you, find somebody to give you, uh, to look at you. Sometimes you don't know what you're doing yourself unless you look at yourself on the picture or video. Do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes I, I look at, Sometimes I look at the dog I groomed and I'm like, oh, that looks pretty damn good. And then I look at the picture and I'm like, ah, uh, no, not so much. So the tr or a video. So uh, what do you think? What is your advice, Nick, for that? My advice is, is that our first step that we do is we sit down and we actually work with people in their hands to make sure that we're optimizing their tool usage to the best for what they're doing. Because I can I can look at someone's hand and they walk up and tell you what tools are going to fit them instantly. So from there, what I tell people, I guess, depends on your level of what you want to do. I'm going to tell you right now, in every state across the country, there's someone who's good at what you're looking to do. I guarantee they're hiring. And I can tell I'm you right sure. now... All of your top grooming people out there, they're all hiring. If you want to become really good or the best, and I know several of them that will they'll pay moving expenses. They want you to come. So if you really want to learn, seek out the knowledge. You have to hey. get underneath of someone. Hey, if you're in Florida, um, shop where Lindsay Dickin works is hiring. <laughs> they really exactly. are. <laughs> I can start, I can start uh, naming off some different songs. Huh? Test. Test. Test what? Test and show. She's hiring too. Okay, there's another one here in South Florida that is really good at uh, hiring too. Really, really looking for someone good and willing to teach. So, wink, wink on both sides. Come on to Florida. Yeah, but and finding any, somebody right. to, yeah. If any of you guys who are watching this, if you live in a certain state and you want to Facebook message me afterwards, if you want to know a shop in that state, I've been traveling around my whole life. I can find someone if I don't know the answer, but I, I know most of the people out there. So if anyone's looking to relocate somewhere or just, well, I live in Oregon. Who's in Oregon? You know, I can, I can help assist you guys with that too as well. Me too. Don't hesitate to message us. We're always there to help you. And I always say, if I'm not answering your message for two or three days, don't be discouraged. I'm busy, but I will definitely answer, always. I never kind of let messages go. I always answer. So if you have a question, ask. Sometimes, because I'm a dumbass in technology, which, <laughs> which I just found out that there's hidden messages on Facebook. Oh my goodness. 
I'm looking at my technology friend over here that never told me that. Um, I didn't know. So I opened that and I was mortified because there's so many people messaging, asking questions, and I felt like a piece of crap from a message from November, somebody wants an advice on something, or uh, where could I go in, in, I don't know, California to learn to blah, 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 and I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even know that existed. So if you guys are messaging and I'm not answering, just do it on my whatever, somewhere that I can see. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, but it, uh, but it's not funny. I don't know how that works. Like it doesn't say anything on Facebook that you have to go into hidden messages and see, see messages you don't usually see. <laughs> but you know, I I will answer, and I'm sure Nick will answer. He's busy, but you know, give him a couple of days, he'll answer. I'm sure, right, Nick? Yeah, that's exactly it. I tell people the same thing. If you message me and I'm at All-American, you will not get a response. No, of course not. Yeah. You, you will get one five days later. Yeah, but you definitely will get one. That's what I'm always saying to people. Unless, yeah. you know, I never saw the message. It was horrible to realize that. But will answer. Well, the main point of this, this particular conversation right now, if you go to a trade show, it, or we have social media now, and there's so many people out there on social media, and then they're famous, and people know a lot of them. I don't think there's anybody in our industry that would actually say no to you if you're asking for help. I really don't think there's anybody like that out there. And even if you think that somebody is famous in our little industry and unapproachable, it's probably not true. Just approach and you'll see it's not true. So if you guys have any questions about anything, scissors, how to make tools, uh, how to find the sharpener, what's the best way to use your shears, Ask will always be there and answer. Today, uh, is there any more questions? We're just letting you know we're here for you. And if there's any questions, we could do it again, right, Nick? Yes. We could do it again if you want to know things. And we're always here for you. Thank God for freaking technology that, on the other hand, that we could be here and you can ask us questions. And we can ask you questions and communicate. You know, and I'd like to go ahead and expound on that part right there that you say, you know, don't be afraid to talk to different people. People need to understand that the experts that you see, yes, they've worked hard to get there, but we were all just like you at some point. <clears throat> we all worked hard and one day we woke up and we were the expert of something, whether it be a certain breed cut, whether it be scissors, whether it be this or that. We all started the same exact place and time we all whatever where you're coming from we've been there i started going to shows when i was nine years old i think i knew a lot about scissors right I think of course I knew not. About you know different people that i've watched throughout the years i grew up with them i turn around and they're winning worlds with poodles right. and you know everyone's like i can't well, that person's in your booth i can't talk to them and i go i've talked to them for the last 20 years of my life just go ask her a question. So people are approachable. Know the right time, like we talked earlier with the AKC side. If they're busy, try and respect that. But everyone in our industry is human. 99.9% .9 of them are nice, too. Yes, but it's with every industry. And like you said, we all started the same way, busted our asses. We're still busting our asses to this day. No matter if... I'm an expert, you're an expert, we're still working our asses off, we're still learning, we're, we're the same people. I usually say from the stage to, to people that are in the audience, just relax, ask questions, because I still pick up shit from the crate or the floor that my grooming dogs are just shit all over the shop, I still do that. My fingers are still in the shit. 
and it's never going to change. So whether I know more about something than you do doesn't mean that I'm better than you. That means that I've done it longer and I've asked more questions and you can do the same thing and be at my level or higher and high. sky is the limit. So ask people questions. I don't think anybody would say no to you. I don't think and so. If, and if you want to come help tear down any of our booths at the end of the show. That we'll too. Absolutely. Well, I don't have a big booth. I don't have a booth at all. I just had one or two during my my career. But yeah, booths. Uh, I've helped Artero a couple of times. It's a pain in the butt. So I feel you. And you guys, if you want to learn something and you don't have much money, come help, come help with the booth and we'll teach you for that. <laughs> you know, the exchange... She's not wrong on that. We actually have a shortage of employees after COVID. We lost half of our on-the-road staff. They didn't come back from COVID. Um, like our office staff is, is, is functioning good, and she's exactly right. We're All of the booths are looking for help out there. So if you're like, oh, I, I hear people say, like, well, I'm afraid to ask or I don't know. Pretty much everyone in our industry right now is looking for help at trade shows. Yes, definitely. So approach people. People are people. We're all human. And if somebody's rude to you, turn around and forget about them. There's a million, yep. there's a million other people out there that are not rude. So just don't, don't take it to heart. Don't get your feelings hurt. It's not you. It's somebody who's rude. That's it. Not you. Turn around. There's a hundred people here, a hundred people there that could help you and give you advice. So don't get discouraged. Don't overthink that stuff. Humans are humans. All right, if there's no more questions, is there? No more questions. We are going to wrap it up for tonight, but um, if we get more questions about this stuff, I'll con we'll contact you and do it again. I'll be happy to. What you say? perfect to me. Awesome. Thank you very much, Nick. There were absolute beautiful answers to some questions I didn't know, and I'm sure a lot of people that are watching didn't know. Great information. Thank you very much, and I am looking forward to seeing you this month, right? It's this month. I think it's in like a week and a half. Two oh, weeks yeah. soon. Two yeah. weeks, yeah. So yeah. I see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate you guys having me on. Your staff there, they're great to work with. So I Thank appreciate you. it too as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Sounds Stay good. warm. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.